And um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So I, I'm Takuma from Japan. So the focus of today's presentation is on the metals that support our modern lives as buildings, infrastructure, vehicles, and so forth. And in particular, metals uh, using energy technologies are expanding in both quantity and variety, as you can see here. So the picture here shows the types of metals uh, using energy technology from the past to the present. But we can say um, modern energy technologies like um, solar photovoltaics, wind turbines, and batteries all together require almost 50 metals. So the key perspective here is what will the demand for these metals be in the coming decades, right? So uh, we gathered 546 data points for 22 metals for which data could be obtained from scientific um, articles published, last, um, published in the history. So the black straight line here indicates the historical mine production and blue and red dots represent future demand for energy technologies and all end uses respectively. So when looking at the um, platinum, for example, we, we can see clear increasing trend of demand by 2050, but unsurprisingly, the estimates are quite wide ranging from somewhere around 0 0.7 kiloton to um, 1.8 kiloton in 2050. So here we have figures showing future demand trends for six key metals uh, related to solar photovoltaics. So again, the estimated demands are wide ranging, but uh, we can see some studies estimated demands for metals like indium, um, selenium and tellurium uh, for just solar PV could increase 10 to 20 times higher than annual mine production, uh, which indicates that the energy transition could be the main dominant, um, you know, dominant driver of future demand growth. And when looking at the several key metals related with electric vehicles and wind power systems, and these technologies are clearly a major driver of increased demand for metals like uh, dysprosium, uh, neodymium, lithium, and cobalt. And many studies actually estimated that demand for just energy technologies could many times exceed current mine production by 2050. Uh, we recently updated the data set for six major metals, uh, which include steel, aluminum, copper, zinc, lead, and nickel. So the key finding here is the demand for all major metals is likely to increase continuously over the 21st century, um, except lead, uh, as shown here. Um, so in the case of copper, uh, demand is expected to increase 2.5 hold by 2050 and fourfold by the end of the century based on the results of the um, existing scientific research. So after seeing these pictures of increasing demand, one might wonder um, you know, if we will physically run out and be unable to supply them, right? But a closer look at the data reveals that question regarding future availability is not whether uh, there will, will be enough, but rather about complex list about like environmental, social, and governance factors. So uh, here we have several plots showing the ratio of reserves to production over the last 25 years uh, for selected commodities. And what we can see here is the global reserves for most metals have not significantly decreased um, relative to production over time. So according to the authors, this phenomena is the result of the diminishment of exhausted reserves by the further donation of all not, uh, you know, known ovaries as um, you know, explanation progresses. And they suggest that ESG risk factors are likely to be the main source of risk in the future metal supply in the coming decades, more so than direct reserve depletion. And this is an excellent work done by the research group at the University of Queensland, uh, looking at such ESG risk in undeveloped bodies of selected metals that are closely related to energy technologies. And they found that many mining projects face co-occurring ESG risks, which could limit future metal supply. So when we look at the copper, we see a particular high impact uh, related to land disturbance uh, due to higher demand and lower lock to metal ratio. So the availability of metals, at least in the coming decades, will depend not on whether the sort of resources are physically present, but on whether these ESG risks can be adequately governed. And I will come back to this point later. So environmental risks among ESG in the context of mining activities are particularly um, 
in water, mine waste, and biodiversity, but carbon emissions from metal production are becoming increasingly important um, in the context of climate change mitigation. So this figure shows the contribution of metal production to the global emissions over the past 20 years. And what we can see is the share of metal production has gradually increased over time and now exceeds 10% implying a relative increase in the climate impact from metal production. So the question is why the climate impact from metal production is increasing. So the first factor is simply the growth in production. So these figures show the emission intensity and factors that um, contributed to the change in absolute emissions over the past 100 years, using steel as an example here. And we see that industry has done very well in reducing emissions per unit of production. But the figure on the right shows that explosive growth in production has you know, entirely offset the efficiency gains, uh, which result in a net emissions increase. We can actually also see the efficiency gains has stagnated over the last 20 years or so. And this stagnation is due to the explosion of production in emerging economies with less efficient technologies. And this is the um, you know, second reason why climate impacts from metal production are increasing. So the figure here shows the breakdown of steel production in each region ranked by technology efficiency level. And clearly what we can say is the production activity in regions with less efficient technologies has grown in recent years which has contributed to the increase in emissions per unit of production. And another important factor is the decline of rise. So the figure here shows the energy consumption associated with copper production in Chile uh, from 2001 to um, 2017, which reveals that fuel consumption per unit of copper production has increased by 100% and electricity consumption by 30%, with a decline in rise shown in the bottom figure. And importantly, uh, modeling studies based on um, currently identified resources um, indicates copper ore glaze will likely continue to decline in the future unless the technological break close through occurs. So the future demand, uh, you know, future demand glaze may not cause physical depletion, but will encourage a shift to lower quality deposit, making uh, climate change mitigation from metal production more difficult in the coming years. So looking at these trends, we can say that metals play a dual role of being both a negative impactor through their production activities and the supply of technologies essential for climate change mitigation. This means there are two important drivers for future metal cycles, which are the deployment of energy technologies um, or you know, the global energy transition and the imposition of emissions budget on production activities. So from now I will and you know, deep dive into uh, these perspectives based on some of the work uh, that we did um, you know, in the last few years. So let me begin by examining the implications of the global energy transition on resource extraction from a governance perspective particularly. So basically what we tried to do was to estimate how much material would be needed for future energy systems and where mining activities would take place and what the role of circular economy would be. And so this is a, a conceptual diagram of the modeling approach, which is unique in that it uses a total material requirement indicator to capture all used and unused resource extraction, like um, mine waste or overburden. And we apply this modeling framework to the uh, international energy agency scenarios, which describe pathways to limit the global mean temperature rise to well below two degrees, as well as a business as usual scenario. So here we can see the total material requirements for the global energy transition from 2015 to 2050. And what we found was the transition in both the electricity and transport sector could reduce fossil fuel production, but at the same time, increasing resource extraction associated with metal requirement by more than factor of seven by 2050. And as you can see, such a substantial increase is primarily the increase in the extraction of iron, copper, um, nickel, silver, uh, tellurium, cobalt, and lithium used mainly for the production of solar photovoltaics and electric cars. So to achieve a sustainable energy transition, we need to think about how we design 
our material cycles and how we govern the explosion of resource extraction in conjunction with technology deployment. And um, this is one important message from this particular case study. And to properly govern mining activities, we need to know where the mining will take place. Right? So to answer this question, we used a detailed mining level data set to estimate which mines are most likely to be developed to meet the growing future demand. And here is the aggregated result. We see countries with poor resource governance will underpin the energy transition. And what we can see from here is that around 32% of resource extraction in, in the electricity sector will take place in countries with weak, poor and failing resource governance. And this situation is actually worse in the transport sector, where extraction in countries with weak, poor and uh, failing resource governance accounts for around 40% of the total extraction. When looking at the country level breakdown, uh, we can see Chile and Australia, which have good and satisfactory resource governance, uh, respectively, are the dominant player in mining. But countries with weak and poor resource governance, like uh, DL Congo, Madagascar, and Guatemala, are also high on the list, as you can see here. Uh, we can also see a more problematic picture in the relative changes. So the transition in both the electricity and transport sectors will lead to the largest increase in resource extraction in countries with poor resource governance. And this category includes the DL Congo, Guatemala, um, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, and Madagascar. And so the findings here suggest that if current trends continue, the rapid increase in mining activities that will be induced by the energy transition, global energy transition, is likely to have negative consequences, um, such as environmental degradation or perhaps misappropriation funds, rather than benefiting local communities. So now imagine question is to what extent the circular economy can you know, complement such growth in resource extraction. So the strategies we investigated here are used longer and used more intensely through such as car sharing and life sharing and recycle at the end of life stage. Uh, this is the most obvious one. But the technical potentials of these strategies are just set based on purely theoretical values, not taking into account like realistic constraints such as um, thermodynamic properties during metal smelting and refining. So the potential we investigated here is meant to be an optimistic estimate rather than a um, realistic scenario. And here's the result. And we can see that cities of circular economy strategies can moderate resource extraction growth, which underscores the importance of implementing circular economy strategies in conjunction with the energy transition. But we can also see that the circular economy strategies considered in this study may not entirely offset the increase in resource extraction shown here. And this means that even with ambitious implementation of, of the circular economy, we may still need to rely on mining for decades to come for supporting this particular sector. And here again, relative changes in resource extraction in each region with different levels of resource governance. And what you can say is again, at least a seven fold increase in resource extraction is inevitable in countries with poor resource governance, um, even if uh, circular economy strategies are fully implemented. So a truly sustainable energy transition will require the uh, implementation of complementary measures to enhance resource governance, um, such as responsible sourcing fly mark. And actually these efforts are being increasingly addressed by initiatives um, related to responsible sourcing or ESCO mineral schemes, such as um, you know, ILMA, SELA, and so forth. Unfortunately, our analysis does not directly identify the best way in which resource governance can be improved, but it does identify the main areas of concern, including technologies, minerals, and countries that require um, special attention. So uh, this is a summary of the findings of this case study. So the paper is open access, so you can read it for free if you are interested. Okay, so now let's move on to a, another study about the imposition of emissions budget on metal production. And so what we have tried to do here is to estimate how much metal can be produced and used in a hypothetical world where the amount of carbon that can be emitted into the atmosphere is structurally controlled, right? 
And so we, we have this, we have done this calculation for all six major metals uh, like steel and aluminum, but I will focus on copper in this presentation. So uh, this is an overview of the system model using this study. So the model quantifies the sequence of events in which ore is extracted from the lithium sphere, uh, defined through smelting and refining processes, and transformed into uh, final products through fabrication and manufacturing processes, and then um, turned into waste, which can be recovered or buried in a landfill. So the basis of the model is a mass balancing occasion uh, equation based on the law of mass conservation, and each process is represented as a series of simultaneous equations, which is kind of a simple equation. But um, so because our focus is on global copper flows, we try to understand the flow of copper traded internationally um, by reconciling international trade statistics. So uh, this figure shows the current international copper trade flows where we can see um, that China is playing a major role in both ex imports and exports. And Chile uh, clearly plays an important role in exports, uh, reflecting the magnitude of its mining capacity, which is kind of obvious. But we can also see that Japan, which does not have large mines, processes imported raw materials into products and exports them in large quantities and, and so have a large impact in trade. And this kind of data provides the basic information on where mined metals are processed and where they accumulate as products or infrastructure um, that actually support our um, you know, daily lives. And this slide shows the uh, global distribution of in-use metal stocks uh, calculated by the system model. Um, so the figure here shows the in-use stock per capita with darker colors indicating larger values. And what we can say is a large portion of stocks, I mean, these products or infrastructure are concentrated in developed countries, such as North America and Western Europe, with little accumulation in developing countries, especially in Africa. More specifically, the highest 20% of the world population ordered in terms of metal stock per person accounted for 60 or 75% of the world's total metal stock while the lowest 20% accounted for uh, only about 1% of the uh, total metal stock. When we look more closely uh, at the copper, uh, we see there is a large gap in you know, per capita stock between high income countries and the global average. And this figure is actually quite important for understanding future copper demand. The developed countries generally follow a similar growth pattern showing down when they have stockpiled about like 200 kilograms of copper per person. So if countries around the world follow the similar growth pattern of current high income countries, uh, we can make pretty good guesses as to how the global copper stock will grow in the future and how much copper would need to be produced to form that stock growth. And so these figures are the combined picture of future copper flows and stocks estimated by such logic and the demand required by the energy system discussed earlier in this presentation, um, as you can see by the, uh, this figure. So according to the model, global final demand for copper could increase by a factor of 2.5 by 250, um, reaching about 62 million metric tons, of which roughly 4% will come from renewable energy-based power plants and 14% will come from um, electric vehicles. Uh, including HEV, BHEV, and so forth. And battery electric vehicles are the primary driver of this growth, accounting for 10% of final demand in 2050, as you can see here. And we compare our estimates of refined copper demand with 54 data from previous studies, and we found good agreement with uh, these previous studies for both 2030 and 2050. And importantly, in this case, the cumulative oil requirement during the scenario period is approximately um, 1,200 megaton copper content, uh, megaton content copper at maximum, which is well below the currently identified resources of 3,000 megaton copper. So again, it is reasonable to conclude that natural copper resources will not be physically depleted within this time frame. But the carbon emissions 
and associated with this increase in demand can be problematic. So the figure here shows the contribution of copper production to the emissions budget to limit the global mean temperature rise to, to uh, less than 1.5 degree in this case. So if no action is taken, we see that um, copper-related emissions could account for 2.7% of the total emissions budget by 2050, up from 0.3% uh, today. And if we can improve energy efficiency and increase the recycling capacity and electrify some processes, we can cut these emissions in half, uh, which is kind of an easy step, but it is clearly not enough to make the copper sector equally responsible for emission reduction to all sectors. So we have a mitigation gap here. So the question arises as to how to fill this mitigation gap, right? Um, so if we were to rely 100% on production size strategies to close the mitigation gap, the emission intensity of primary production loads will need to be reduced by more than 50% um, by 2030 and almost 100% by 2050. And we may be able to achieve this through uh, further strategies on the production side, such as you know, complete electrification, hydrogen, biofuels, and, and, and so forth. But the key point here is that the time we have left is extremely limited. And the adoption of new technologies on a global scale will take some time, as you can see here for, for the example of nuclear, wind, and you know, other types of technologies. So I think it is quite important to examine how we can bridge the mitigation gap if production side measures cannot be scaled up sufficiently in time and, and prepare for such a case. So we try to estimate how much copper could be used within the emissions budget, um, you know, if we can't scale up the production side technologies. So uh, this calculation was done with uh, our newly constructed system model uh, called the, the material budget model. So this approach uh, builds up on a dynamic material flow analysis and coupled with a detailed data set of um, and emission factors and optimization routines, uh, which allows for the systematic quantification of multi-year copper cycles under the emissions budget, while um, ensuring a dynamic mass balance of stocks and the players in the system. And here we have a figure showing the per capita copper stock available under the emissions budget under civil technology assumptions, as you can see here. And what we can see is if our service demand like um, mobility, housing, and communication could be met with about a quarter less stock per capita relative to the business as usual scenario, uh, shown in the dark line, uh, sorry, gray line, and emission from copper production could be kept within the emissions budget, even you know, without innovation in, in production technology. And of course, if innovations on the production side are successfully implemented, uh, such resource constraints can be alleviated. But if we fail to scale up production side measures in time, um, decarbonization of the entire copper cycle will not be an effort of the copper industry alone, but will require action by a variety of stakeholders, including copper users. And this table provides the further insight on the role of each stakeholder. So the traditional approach, which expects and promotes technological innovation on the production side, generally requires only the efforts of um, miners, smelters, and definers, and perhaps with the appropriate support of government policy. But as demonstrated in this study, if we fail to scale up production size strategies in time, a more system-wide solution is required, as you can see here, with actions not only by like miners or smelters, but by all the stakeholders um, involved in the copper cycle, including product designers, urban planners, and property owners, and you know, general consumers, and so forth. And so in order to encourage such actions, I mean, collective actions, we need a shared future vision that, that can encourage collective action among all the various stakeholders. So to support such a domain, we, we try to explain which flows will change, how, and to what extent by um, representing the different material cycles as a Sankey diagram shown here, and explore key intervention opportunities in, in the transition to a sustainable future from a material cycle perspective, not on the, you know, the production process perspective. 
So, okay, uh, this is a summary of the findings from this particular case study. So the paper is also open access. You, so you can download it and read it for free and, you know. Okay, so the collectively, um, metals and minerals will need to play a dual role as suppliers of essential technologies for climate change mitigation and reducing negative impacts from the production activities. And this requires, uh, firstly, responsible governance of resource extraction, especially in developing countries and in relation to the deployment of energy technologies. And secondly, improved resource efficiency to meet service demand with less uh, resource throughput. And, and, and I think that both of these two are key requirements for climate change mitigation um, supported by sustainable mineral use and copper use. Um, okay, so the analysis presented today does not yet deep dive into the uh, demand side strategies, you know, what, what we can do on the demand side, right? So we have tried to address this domain in a five-year research project entitled the Material Flow Innovation Research Program. So this is an overview of the research program, which is uh, quite wide, but um, this is an example of some ongoing work on Japanese steel flows uh, where we are trying to better understand material flows uh, in a zero emissions future by representing detailed product grades and demand sectors, as you can see. And with this type of analysis, we, we are kind of trying to identify um, key intervention opportunities from a demand side perspective and build kind of better cooperation between uh, material suppliers and material consumers to support collective action. So uh, we hope to share the results of this domain uh, in the near future. Okay, um, thank you so much for your kind of attention.